Welcome to Ambo TV. Each week we bring you dynamic sermons from next generation pastors from across the country and as always they're bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God and then we discuss them right here in studio. I'm Dean, hashtag so blessed Windsor and I'm so excited you guys joined us today for what is going to be an amazing show. We have three powerful sermons coming from Florida, Washington and right here in New York. First up is Cape Christian Church in Cape Coral, Florida and they have guest pastor John Weasel, and he's preaching about how to get unstuck or stop feeling like you're trapped by finding freedom in Jesus. This is a really cool sermon. I can't wait for you guys to check it out. Next, we're going to go to Poughkeepsie, New York with my friend, Pastor Stephen Francis, and he's talking about the things Jesus never said. You know, stuff like God helps those who help themselves. Well, Pastor Stephen is here to clear up some wrong ideas or sayings we may have attributed to Jesus and instead point us to what Jesus actually said. I'm looking forward to this one. Lastly, we go to Vancouver, Washington, the Crossroads Community Church with Pastor Daniel Fusco. That's right, the cool pastor with the dreads. And he's speaking on how we live an amen life, which is a life spent in the presence of God, honoring God through our actions. Then I'll be joined in studio by one of our favorites, Pastor Ashley Abercrombie from Liberty Church right here in Manhattan. She's here to not only break down these messages, but also talk about her new book, The Rise of the Truth Teller. I can't wait to talk to her a little later, but right now, let's go right to Cape Christian Church with guest pastor John Weasel. But the truth of the matter is that each and every one of us, at one time in our life, and some of us even today, can relate to Jewel, can relate to feeling trapped, can relate to feeling stuck can relate to, to looking out and seeing everybody else living their lives, but we just can't seem to have what they have. How come everybody around me seems to be filled with so much joy and I'm struggling with this depression? How come everybody around me seems so free, but I can't break through this cycle of sin in my life? How come, how come everybody out there looks to have it all together, but I, I'm, I'm trapped by by these chains of addiction or, or unforgiveness or bitterness in my heart. I don't know what it is for you today. I don't know what that, that glass cage is in your life that is keeping you from living life to the fullest. Because Jesus came and he said in John 10, 10, that he came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And too many too many believers, too many Christians, too many followers of Jesus in this country are not living that abundant life. We're living life in these cages when Jesus has already paid the price for so much more. And that's the position. You guys are, you guys are getting it this morning. That's right. Pastor Corey said you have 30 minutes, but if you keep clapping, it just might be 45 minutes. <laughs> that's the position that this woman was in. She was, she was bound by this sickness in her life. She was looking at everybody else as they would come and go and, and not be able to do that herself because when we read the scripture, we read it with a 2019 mindset. Like it, it was just something she had to deal with. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and learn to live with it. Go to a doctor, take a pill, do this, do that. Self-help book, take yoga, all of these other things that we try to make ourselves better. She, she couldn't do that because culturally, contextually, the sickness that she had made her unclean. And if we understand the Old Testament law as it was given to Moses, then what that means is that this woman was restricted in terms of where she could go, when she could go there, who she could talk to, who she could interact with, where she could live. She couldn't live at her parents' house. Her parents have kicked her out of the house at this point. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't, she couldn't come into any physical contact with anybody else. She couldn't touch anybody, hug anybody, say hi to anybody. This is the woman that when you saw her walking down the street, you crossed to the other side because you wanted nothing to do with her. We're not even given this woman's name. All we know her as is the woman with the issue of blood. She was defined by her sickness. She was defined by her chains. She was defined by the thing that held her back. And maybe, maybe you can relate to that today. Maybe you can relate to being defined by your struggle, being defined by, by that thing in your life that you just can't seem to break through. But as we read this story, I'm thankful that it doesn't end there. 
Because the Bible says that, that she had heard about Jesus, right? It says that she, she heard about Jesus. And so she said, if I could just, if I could just touch his robe, then I'll know I'll be, I'll be healed. And verse 29 says that immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she'd been healed. She'd heard about Jesus, but she didn't leave it there because she fought through the crowd to touch Jesus. This morning, I want you to know that it's not enough to just hear about Jesus. It's not enough to come into church week after week after week and hear about Jesus. The question you have to ask yourself is, when is the last time you fought through the crowd and touched Jesus? Sometimes I think we can, we can come to church and we can receive so much. We see Pastor Corey at the back door. Pastor Corey, your message really touched me today. Worship really touched me today. God, God really touched my heart today. And listen, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Yes, God reaches down into our circumstances and he meets us right where we're at. But here's the thing. This woman wasn't waiting for Jesus to come and touch her. She said, I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I'm gonna fight through the crowd. Why? Because I need to touch him. Yes, God, we, we come to church and God speaks to us and God touches us. But when's the last time you went home and got on your knees and you touched him? Woo! This woman, she touched she touched Jesus, and the Bible says that immediately, immediately the bleeding stopped. Immediately she knew it was different. Immediately there was a change that happened inside of her. What the doctors couldn't do in 12 years, Jesus was able to do immediately. What all of her resources couldn't buy her and couldn't get her and couldn't attain for her, Jesus was able to give her immediately. All right, Pastor Weasel, first time on the show, guest, uh, guest pastoring down in Cape Coral, Florida, doing a great job. Pastor Ashley Abercrombie, back in the house. Thank you so much for being here. I'm again. so happy to be back. Yay. I love being with you guys. Hey, you know you are our first guest. <laughs> I know. Yay. So, awesome. so it's always so great to have you here. Um, all right, so let's just jump right into his sermon and what yes. he's talking about, the woman with the issue of blood. Mm. And, and he also brings up this good point, though, about, you know, touching Jesus, and, and yeah. she fought through the crowd to touch him. Obviously, we can't physically touch Jesus right now. Um, and he's saying it's more than just showing up and hearing the word. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, what's the more? What, mm -hmm. what more can we do to kind of have that physical or, or spiritual touch yeah. with Jesus? Well, I think God gives us his presence and his power. And in our desperation, we're able to shed off our desire to be approved by others or to please people. And we shed off our worries about what other people think so we can go after the thing that God has for us, whether that's freedom or it's healing or it's some type of understanding or it's bringing ourselves into the presence of God. I think that there's plenty of ways we can experience him. And the other ways are through people. Mm -hmm. So we actually experience the fullness of God through our relationships with others. God created us to be interdependent on other people. Um, I love that he responds to that moment with, um, he says, who touched me? Because uh -huh. she was touching him and he felt it. He experienced, he said, I felt my power go out. And so it shows you that there's a real connection that can happen between people that brings freedom, that brings wholeness, that brings an understanding that we're not alone and that we can be okay. And I think that's yeah. really important. I mean, it's such a beautiful thing too. Yeah, Especially, it is. And that story, is, it's one that kind of, it, it, it has a common thread throughout yeah. you know Jesus's his walk his entire yes. walk it's you know people were just drawn to him because of that yes. and because you know so we can still kind of feel that mm -hmm. as practicing Christians but mm -hmm. to have non-believers and and mm -hmm. to just try to show them and mm -hmm. and have them experience that it's it's something great now as a pastor and in your mm -hmm. pastoral work have you mm -hmm. been able to kind of show people that, that love and that experience of Jesus' power? Yes, I think so. I mean, our life is a living story. I mean, yeah. I personally have 16 years of recovery from all kinds of addictions, so yeah. I so relate to this story in the Bible <laughs> on a very personal, deep level. Yeah. And I think for having found freedom, we can understand yeah. that other people can find it as well when they look at our lives. All right, I love it. And we're going to get back into that in depth some more <laughs> when we come back with more Ambo TV. Welcome 
Welcome back to Ambo TV, where we bring you next generation pastors from across the country. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor John in Cape Coral, Florida. But right now, I want to get to Pastor Stephen Francis in Poughkeepsie, New York. Let's go ahead and check him out. If you're following today, I want you to write this down. That when you deserve condemnation, Jesus gives you mercy. See, this first story comes from John chapter 8. And it begins in verse 1. It says, but when Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, I want you to put this in your 2019 mindset here, Valley family. See, these religious leaders who took upon the responsibility to be enforcers of God's law catch a woman in adultery. Now, here's the thing I'd never understood about this story. How do a group of men catch a woman in adultery? What was the story behind that? Where was also the person that she did adultery with? Because according to the law, both of these people should have gotten in trouble. But we don't know how they caught her. We don't know why the other person wasn't brought forward. But we do know that this woman was caught and she was guilty. And according to these people that are supposed to be representatives of God, she was guilty of being stoned. So, of course, she's thinking to herself in this moment that Jesus, who is supposed to be God in the flesh, is going to punish her because she's guilty. But we see Jesus say this in John 8, verse 7. Jesus says, let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then it says after this, that he bends over and he begins to draw in the sand. And there's a lot of theological debate about what Jesus wrote in the sand. Some people say that he wrote down the Ten Commandments so that they had a refresher in their mind of the sins that uh, were, might have been in their lives. Some say that, the, that Jesus wrote their names down because of passage of scriptures that talks about woe to those whose names are written in the sand. I like to think that Jesus needed to pick up milk on his way home, so he wrote in the sand, pick up milk on the way home. Jesus was 100% man, people. I'm sure maybe he needed a reminder. I don't know. Nevertheless, Jesus begins to write in the sand, and as he's writing in the sand, all of these Pharisees, all of these religious leaders begin to walk away because they know that they are guilty of sin. Jesus then lifts his head up, and says to the woman in verse 10, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus is making a very big statement here. And I want to say this for anybody in here. Maybe this is your first time in church in a while. Maybe you're still trying to figure out if this is something that you want to follow. If you or someone you know has ever been dragged by a religious person because of an act that they have committed, please know that that is not a representation of Jesus himself. All right, so I want a hard pause <laughs> on where Pastor Stephen Francis is saying, if you've ever been dragged by a religious person, so I'm a member of some online discussion groups. Yeah. You know, uh, everybody's kind of their own theologian. And, but, right. you know, we, <laughs> we like 2019, to 2019, yes. Exactly. <laughs> but we do like to share, you know, affirmations and stuff like that. But the biggest thing I see in this huge trend right now mm. is Christians attacking other Christians, is Christians attacking denominations. Mm. Why has this, this major, you know, this quote from Jesus that has been, it stood the test of time. Why has this one quote? Let he who is without sin cast mm. the first stone. Why is that the first one that people tend to forget? Like, seriously. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know the, the full answer to that question, to be honest. Okay. But I do think that sometimes we are so out of touch with our own brokenness mm. and we are so unwilling to admit that we have sin in our own life. And, and I think sometimes we separate sin from attitudes, which is so why I love Jesus. Mm. Because whatever you do in your action, the Old Testament, you could have punishment for, like being stoned for adultery. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about what's happening in our heart, what's happening in our mind. He even talks about if you're angry with someone in your heart, you might as well have killed them. If you have lust in your heart, you might as well have slept with them. And so Jesus is, is concerned with our internal motivations. And I think sometimes we forget that. We're like, well, I'm not doing anything bad, so I'm going to drag you for doing something bad. And Jesus is like, you're doing bad things in your heart. It's no different. And so I think we each have to remember that we're broken. And then the downside of social media is that it's a snapshot. Mm. So somebody does one thing one time or posts something and then you make an assumption about what they believe, what they value, what their convictions are when you have no idea who the whole person is. And we have to stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I like to say, and I, I say this to my wife, I say this to my kids, mm -hmm. Jesus is going to look at your Facebook. <laughs> okay. Gonna, he cares about the comment this section, be, right? Like it's this could be an account. It, totally. It, the, the if is there. Like, yes. just look, look, if we have access to it, Jesus yes. does. So. Come on. All right, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but right now I want to throw it to Pastor Daniel Fusco in Vancouver, Washington. Let's go ahead and check him out. You should give back what he, what God has given to you because we start with this idea that we give to the Lord glory and strength. We give to the Lord the glory to his name. We bring him an offering and we come before him and we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now in each one of these, this is a life principle. This is the way a follower of Jesus would live differently from other people where we realize that everything that we have is actually a gift from the Lord, right? And because we realize that God has entrusted us with these gifts, we don't just want to hoard them for ourselves. When you hoard the gifts that you have, what do we call that? Selfishness. And if a person believes, don't you love how straightforward I was about that? Like, like no qualities, that's selfishness. And that's exactly what it is, right? When, when you know that somebody has a need and you can help it, but you don't want to, you don't feel like it, it's not my problem. All of those are our heart conditions of selfishness. But we follow the selfless savior. We follow Jesus who, he wasn't the one who was caught in the trap and bondage to sin. He was the one who was outside of it. He was perfect. And he's like, you know what? I see my people, all of humanity broken by sin. And I'm going to go and I'm going to give my life for them. And for you and I, as we follow Jesus, as we believe in Jesus, as we rejoice in Jesus, we realize that when God entrusts things to us, our job is to simply respond to Jesus by giving back to the Lord the things that he's given us. See, because God wants us to steward what's his, and so we don't hold on to these things on our own. So notice, give to the Lord, O oh, families of the people. Give to the Lord glory and strength. So God doesn't need our glory, and God doesn't need our strength because God is completely glorious, and God is completely powerful, right? God spoke all of creation into existence. God doesn't need you with your you know, a 385 pound bench press, which is probably like two of you in this room, me being not one of them. <laughs> For others of you, it's like, man, you don't even, the only thing you lift is you lift that slice of pizza to your mouth. That's fitness. Fitness, I'll fit this whole pizza into my mouth. <laughs> you like, that's a good one. I live on now, that's a perspective, right? But the, the thing is, is that as people created in the image and likeness of God, there is a glory that God has shared with us. You don't realize, like when it says that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, it means that God created you gloriously in his image and likeness. The fact that when God said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and male and female, he created them. There is something inherently amazing about that. But we don't just keep the glory for ourselves. We give it back. The strength that you have, the facilities of your body. We don't just keep them for ourselves. I'm going to use that for this. So you, you say, God, you have given me strength. What would you have me to do with that strength? See, we turn the things that we've been given that God has entrusted to us. And we say, God, how can I give this back to you? We give the Lord the glory that's due his name. Because God is glorious. So uh, I, this is also a common theme in the show. And, and, and you know, Pastor Daniel Fusco touches on it really well here. And that's 
how, you know, how do you be a good steward of, of the gifts that God has given you? And, and how do you give glory, you know, constantly without kind of being or feeling repetitive? You know what I mean? So what would be a good way that you personally, you know, give glory without falling into like monotony? Totally. Well, I think first is acknowledging that most of life is very boring. Mm. And we're taught that it's mountaintop all the time or it's lowest of the low. But the reality is doing the same thing in and out daily, the rhythms that we have of life can be kind of boring. Okay. But I think stewarding what we have, recognizing where we are right now and not despising it. So we have the opportunity to use our gifts where we are. Even if we're at a job that we don't like, we have an opportunity to steward our giftings. Even if we are at home with people that we may or may not like, we have an opportunity <laughs> to steward our giftings. Yeah. And so I think it's really important for us to not despise where we are because God's glory is in the ordinary. We don't have to go out and make some spectacular thing. God is right where we are right now. All right, I enjoy that. Yeah. I, I can live with that explanation. <laughs> now, now there may be some people that, think, you know, <laughs> All right, I'm doing my tithing. I'm giving my 10%. Sure. I'm doing what I have to do. I'm good. Yeah. That's my glory. I'm giving my glory. Sure. I'm good. That can't be, you know, the be all and all. There, there has right. to be more, yes. correct? Of course. Yes. I think that can even just feel disconnected. Like, this is just something that I do. And that gives us an excuse to not deal with the rest of our life. But the reality is, we're supposed to show God's goodness to the best of our ability, even in our brokenness, right where we are. He yeah. wants all of us. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing to spread around God's light, to spread around God's goodness as we are in the world right now. Yeah. You know, I miss the days too where, you know, you would watch um, football games and, you know, the, the championship and, and the team would always, uh, God, God was the first person that they thanked. And, and yeah. somewhere along the line, somewhere down the years, it just, it's kind of fallen out of popularity. Mm -hmm. So this is my plea to sports teams of America. <laughs> Start thanking God again, give him his glory. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a really quick break, but we're gonna be right back with more Ambo TV. Back to Ambo TV, bringing a fresh new style to the Word of God. Before the break, we were checking out Pastor Daniel Fusco, but right now I want to throw it back to Pastor John in Cape Coral, Florida. Jesus restores identity. Jesus does all of that stuff. It's on us to live it. It's on us to, to walk it out on a daily basis. And Jesus, in one instant, is able to answer the questions that you've been asking. The thing that you need, you have access to right now in one encounter with Jesus. The problem is the enemy tries to, to keep us trapped, right? He, he, he gets us to live in this mindset, well, you'll always be. You'll always be, or you'll never have. You'll always be like your dad was. You're never gonna, you're never gonna beat that addiction. You're never going to have a point in your life where you're just so full of the joy. You read the joy of the Lord is my strength, and it's like, I don't relate to that. You'll never have that. And so what we do is we, we, we trick ourselves into thinking that this is all we're ever gonna know. It's like the elephant that was chained to the pole. As a baby, this elephant gets chained to a pole and it starts walking around and it learns that I can't go any further than this. It comes over here. I, this, is, this is all, this is as far as I can go. And as a, as a young elephant, it's trained that this is, this is as far as you can go. You'll never get out there. This one little patch of earth is all you will ever see. And as the baby elephant begins to grow, it gets big enough to be able to rip the pole right out of the ground. But it doesn't. Why? Because in its head, this is all I know. This is all I'm ever going to have. Gets to a point where they'll even cut the chain off. And a full-grown elephant will walk in a 10-foot circle. Why? Because they've tricked him to believe that this is all he'll ever experience. The enemy has us living this way, thinking that this is all we'll know. This is all I've ever seen. I'm just a product of my circumstances. I didn't have a dad to show me. I've never walked. I, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like. Listen, no matter what it is that you need, and no matter what is that, that longing inside of you, Jesus is able to meet that in one second. Just one, one encounter with him. She reaches out, she touches his robe, and immediately she's made whole. And, and if that was the end of the story, it'd be great. If that was the end of the story, it'd be like, awesome. Yeah. Yay, Jesus, right? Like, 
Another miracle. That's, that's so cool. But you continue reading and look at what Jesus says in verse 34 after she comes back. Jesus says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. What did Jesus call her? What do we call her? Woman with the issue of blood. We don't, we don't know her name. We know her by her sickness. When Jesus looked at her, he didn't know her by her sickness. He knew her as daughter. Why? Because she was never the woman with the issue of blood to Jesus. To Jesus, she was always daughter. This morning, you come in and you've allowed the world to define you. You've allowed other people to define you. You've allowed your, your cage, your chains, the thing that holds you back, you've allowed that to define you. Some of you, you look in the, in the mirror and you allow you to define you. But this morning as God looks at you, he doesn't see your struggle. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your depression or anxiety, the bitterness inside of you. What Jesus says when he looks at you is he says, you are my son and you are my daughter. You are my beloved. You are my child and I love you. That's what he says when he, you know what the Bible says about us? The Bible says that we are God's masterpiece in all of creation. God looks down on everything that he made and he says, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. You're my favorite. You're my favorite. Each and every one of us are his favorite. Why? Because God looks and he, he tells us for me, he says, look, you're coming to me for a physical healing. You think you know what you want. You think you know what you need. I'll, I'll give you what you, I'll give you what you think you need. But then I'm going to, I'm going to, answer the real longing inside of you. I mean, we're talking God's blessings here. And, and God does not, he, he never hands us a blessing. It's mm. always, it's almost like um, the way Jesus spoke in parables. Mm. It's always kind of cryptic almost. You know, you <laughs> say, God, I really need a better job. I need a raise. So I need some, and the next week you get fired, right? But, and it seems like a terrible thing, but sure. no, God is just clearing the path for you. He's clearing the way. And, and we don't see it like that a lot of times. We think, oh, God, like I don't have a job now. Now I'm really up the creek. So, but you're not seeing God's, you're, you're not identifying that that was the blessing. Sure. He was clearing the path. So how do we help people? How do you help people mm -hmm. better identify blessings and not look at things so negatively? Totally. Well, I think the first step is recognizing that blessing does not equate into things and blessing does not equate into us getting our way. Mm. And God's blessings look so different. Sometimes suffering is a blessing. Sometimes mm. loss is a blessing. Like we have no idea, just like what you're talking about, I have no idea that God is blessing us in many different ways. And I think sometimes in our world, we're set up to think that success is a blessing or a certain economic bracket is the blessing. And that's not at all how God works. It's not at all, like blessing is not contingent on our economic status and it's not contingent on the things that we have. God's blessing comes in different ways. And the last thing I'll say about that is he was talking about the joy of the Lord being our strength. Mm -hmm. And I think so often we've been taught that joy is sort of happiness. But if you look at the story of Nehemiah where he's talking about it, he was going through hard things. He was being persecuted. He was being mocked. He was being criticized. He was being gossiped about, but still he was saying in the midst of this, the joy of the Lord is my strength. In the midst of it, the joy yes. of the Lord is my strength. I mean, those are amazing words and words we should all repeat. Uh, we're going to go ahead and throw it over to Pastor Stephen Francis and let him wrap up his sermon, but we'll be right back. For everyone in here, saved or unsaved, let me encourage you with this that you need to always run to Jesus and not away from Jesus. Some of us have grown up in church. Some of us know what, it, what it's like to feel guilty because of religion. And because of that, sometimes we sin. Sometimes we fall into a particular thing. And instead of running to Jesus saying, Jesus, I messed up. I'm sorry. Take me in your arms. We think that God is mad at us. We think that now he's out to get us. But based off of these stories that I just mentioned, that is completely opposite. That despite how bad you are, despite what you've done, and let me be clear, there are still consequences to sin. There are still things that if we commit in this world, there needs to be some level of responsibility made to make it right. But Jesus did not come to condemn us. He did not come to keep us down. He came to restore us and make us whole through his spirit. So no matter how many times you struggle with what you watch online, no matter how many times you struggle 
to forgive, to be kind, to do better for yourself. And I don't know about anybody else in here, but have you ever had it? I know this is true for me, where I try to be a better person, where I try to do something good for myself, and I end up just having a, a huge, just monumental breakdown in failing. You ever have it where you try to be a better person and you end up doing some of the worst things when you were trying to be a better person? It doesn't matter how bad you are. Jesus still loves and forgives. So not only should we run to Jesus, but we should also never forget what he saved us from and how he can save someone else. Can we talk for a moment? I mean, I'm already talking. Something that annoys me with a lot of Christian people, and I've been guilty of this myself, I'm putting myself in that same boat, is that I know what Jesus saved me from. In fact, I'm bold enough to say I believe Jesus saved me from myself. That's how much of a wreck I am. Yet somehow, despite the fact that he saved me and I know all the bad things that I used to do, I can encounter someone that used to do the exact same things and for whatever reason I think I can judge them. You know how many times I've heard people in church being like, oh, I saw him outside of church and he was smoking. Knowing that you were smoking three years ago? Oh, I saw, I saw this person and I can't believe that they're doing this stuff and sleeping together and all that type of stuff. But it's like, weren't you also in the clubs doing that stuff before Jesus saved you? Why then do you feel you can judge somebody else on their journey? I believe that not only should we run to Jesus, but we should remember the salvation that Jesus gave us so much so that it encourages us that when we see people living outside of the things that we believe, when we see people still in the traps and in the struggles that we used to deal with, that we don't see them with condemnation, but we see them as someone that's like, hey, listen, I have a way out. Listen, I have something better. Listen, I know you're, you may not believe it now. You may not know it now, but Jesus has something great for you, and I want to be sure that I reflect that. That's the attitude and the posture that we should have. And with that comes this last point. That not only do we not forget what Jesus saved us from and how he can save someone else, but that we share what Jesus said. Save me from myself, story of my life. <laughs> Same. Is, seriously. <laughs> All right, so I just want to cut right to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whenever somebody asks me, Big change in your life, bro, it was Jesus. You know, <laughs> am I, is there a cookie cutter way to really help, you know, bring someone to Jesus or is it just kind of, we, we have to find our own way? Well, I think that um, the bro is Jesus thing is yeah. like, it's legit. Yeah. Because in John 9, I think about the man who was blind that Jesus totally healed. And okay. the Pharisees could not figure out why was he healed. They brought his parents in. They were investigating. They were trying to figure out what's going on. They asked him the first time. He didn't really have a good answer. They asked him the second time. And he just said to them, look, all I know is that once I was blind and now I can see. <laughs> and so I think sometimes it really is that simple. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we're going to do everything perfectly mm -hmm. after that encounter with God, but it yeah. does mean that, hey, he saved me by his grace. I couldn't do it myself. I tried everything else. I tried willpower. I tried all the things and nothing worked. Uh -huh. God had to do it. And so I think there's some real power in understanding that God saves us from ourselves. That's right. And I'm not looking at anybody specifically, but we don't have to damn people to hell in order to get them to follow Jesus. Uh, with that being said, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, we are going to discuss Pastor Ashley Abercrombie's new book. I can't wait to get into this. So guys, stick around. We'll be right back with more Ambo TV. Welcome back to Ambo TV, home of the next generation pastors. And I'm super excited right now because we get to talk to Pastor Ashley Abercrombie about her new book, The Rise of the Truth Teller. I mean, you gotta, you gotta tell me, where did the title come from? Uh, so the title was birthed out of 
my book proposal, which had about five different very, very bad titles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent at the time was like, this is actually a book about truth. Okay. And so then I just started praying, God, what do you want this title to be? And I'm not trying to be over hyper spiritual about it, but I really wanted it to be a title that would grab people. Yeah. And so as I really started to pray, I thought, man, my whole life message has been about rising in truth and being a truth teller in this world. And so I thought, ah, the rise of the truth teller. And it All stuck right. and my people liked it. <laughs> I mean, it's looking good on the table. Thank I wouldn't you. mind having it on my so coffee too. table. So walk us through, or at least walk me through, mm. you know, your, your writing process here. Like what was... What kind of inspired you to start writing it, and you know what? How, what is the reader going to be taken through on the journey in your book? Yes, great question. All of my writing training has actually been in creative writing, so I was expecting to write a novel as my first book. All so right. it was a real curveball and a surprise that this is what I ended up writing. But I have a deep desire for people to understand the power of a story, and I believe in in the power of my own story, and have seen it worked out as I begin to share all the things that I've gone through, from addiction to eating disorders to struggles with um, you know, recovering from sexual assault and abortion and all the different things that I personally have struggled with in my life. And I love being able to share that with people because I can just see so many folks go, me too. I deal with that too. I've struggled with that too. And I think there's a real power in us understanding that we are broken human beings and that there is hope. And the other real strong message I think people will take away is this idea that you're not alone. You know, as connected as we are in our digital age, yeah. I really believe we're also so still struggling with uh, loneliness and isolation and disconnection. And so I believe it's a real um, good reminder for people that you're not alone. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, God is with you. And you know what? You can build a tribe of people around you who will carry you through life too. I love it. Now, I got to tell you too, since we met and, and we go back now. <laughs> yeah, we now, do. I said we go back. Our relationship <laughs> goes back. I think the, the thing that struck me and, and that impressed me the most was that you were so open. It, immediately, as soon as we met, you were, you held nothing back. Mm -hmm. You discussed, we, we talked about addiction immediately. Yeah. I think within the first 10 minutes, yes. we, we were talking about, <laughs> yeah. and I was telling you about, I was just telling you about mm -hmm. things that I've struggled with. Yeah. Like, are there any stories in here? Is this kind of something that will help people not only cope with their you know, life struggles, but does it help them turn to Jesus as well? Yes, yeah. and I think turning to Jesus is a great place to start, but the Bible talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. And so we, we can get delivered from things, we can get saved from things, but at the same time, we still have to go back into our regular life. We're mm -hmm. still showing up with the same relationships and probably the same job. Yeah. Even when we discover Jesus, even when we go to Him, we still have to deal with our regular life. And so I think I talk so much in the book about practical ways to learn to rest, to learn to be in relationship, to learn to trust God, to learn to keep going in the ordinary moments of life when you want to quit and the things that seem so in insignificant, discovering the power of God, discovering that He's good in the middle of it. And so I think it's a practical help. And often I think the big stories can make us feel like, well, I don't have a huge story like that. I didn't go through those things. Like, is this really for me? And yes, it is because we all have struggles. That's the, the universal commonality between yeah. people is that we have character flaws, we have issues, we have problems, we have pain. No one is exempt from that. No matter what your economic bracket is, no matter what gender you are, everybody struggles. And so I think there's real power in owning that and beginning to own your own story and tell the truth about your life and then rising up and living this life with grace and gumption. There's power in that. Absolutely. So give me one good example in your life, how mm -hmm. God just you know gave you the power to kind of muscle through mm -hmm. and just be the awesome Ash Abercrombie that we <laughs> know today. Well, I think one of those things is I remember the first year of my marriage. I got married in my early 30s okay. and I had already come about halfway through my recovery journey, 16 years now, but mm. I've been about eight years then. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was eight years. And in our marriage, I didn't mean to do this, but I was a total stonewaller. Okay. And every time we'd have a, an issue come up, I didn't know how to talk about it. I would just completely shut down and, and not be able to talk, not be able to connect, not be able to share. And I remember my husband coming and sitting beside me once and he just said, you know what? I know you're not ready to talk right now, but when you are, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And it did something to me. It sort of began to, it was like a, a little hammer tapping on a dam. And it just broke me open in a really powerful way because I realized that God's not asking me to fix myself. He can just be with me. That God understands my struggles and he can just be with me. Mm -hmm. And I went back into recovery at that point because I realized that there was something that I was holding on to. I was unable to talk, unable to connect. And God showed me through that there was a, a very important family member in my life. And when I was younger, um, they couldn't speak back to me. I would ask questions and they would just stare straight ahead.
head as if I wasn't in the room. And so I had experienced that, but I realized I was still holding unforgiveness in my heart against mm. this person. And so because I was holding unforgiveness, I was repeating the very thing I hated in my own marriage. I was becoming the thing that I refused to forgive. And so for me, I had to really take ownership of that again, even eight years into my recovery journey and go, you know what, God, I need some help. I'm struggling to forgive. I'm struggling to let go. Can you help me overcome this hurdle? And through a process of recovery, through deep abiding relationship with God and with people, I was able to overcome that and begin to have healthy conversations in my marriage. So that's one of the examples in the book. That is such <laughs> a beautiful, just an example and, and a talk of, of your faith walk and, yeah. and, and just of, and, and how strong your faith had, yeah. has been and how much it's helped you out. Mm -hmm. And it's always in those moments. It's always in those moments of struggle that God is like, mm. and, and we totally. I think I've found anyway, I've found God the most when I'm able with a breakthrough, mm -hmm. you know, when, when it's something I'm struggling with. Uh, one of my biggest addictions and, and people don't call out addiction enough what I it is. Agree. Yes. Anger is an addiction. 100%. It is. A it's a real struggle for me. Yes. Look, look, yes. I'm telling you. Listen, and we live in New York, and so it's no games. We live in New York, no games. <laughs> Not only do I take PT, which for anybody that doesn't know, in, in, in New York, we, PT is public transportation. Yes. So if you take PT, <laughs> anger, shoulder to shoulder Real. with people, yeah, and you yeah. can feel negativity coming off. Totally. Of yeah, so it's some, but when I'm able to, when somebody steps on my foot or somebody nudges me and yeah. gives me a dirty look and I'm able to <laughs> yeah. just smile at them, yeah. I can, f I know God is like, yeah, yeah, buddy, that's yeah, a win right there. You're totally. winning. Totally. You're winning. Yeah. Yes. So that's actually what I went back to recovery like, for. Like, really? Hi, my name is Ashley, a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who struggles with pride, control, and anger. And so anger was a huge thing for me. Yeah. And imagine being a woman. Yeah. Being angry. Yeah. We're not allowed. Like, nice girls don't get angry. Mm. You know, we have resting bee face in the <laughs> office, or she must <laughs> be on her period, yeah. the different things that we get told when we're angry. Yeah. So we also not only have to overcome the issue of anger, but also the systemic barriers that mm. tell us we can't even be mad. And then same, I think, for men, even as a Christian. Christians aren't supposed to be mad, Ooh. but we do get mad. Yeah. <laughs> so Everybody it's an important thing to deal with. Yeah. Yes. People hear the word addiction, they immediately go to substance, which is true, sure. you know, but there are many, many levels and yes, many other are. kinds of addiction. Yes, there so, are. So, you know, and, and I really hope that if, if anyone at home is watching this now, mm -hmm. you know, if they're suffering from anger or, or yes. pridefulness or, you know, they're holding on to something, you mm -hmm. know, to really check out this book. So I, I'm going to wrap it up with one more question. Mm, please. And that is, um, so now you are a pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, what's a, who's a pastor right now, a contemporary, that you're really looking at mm. as like, you know, the, this is kind of my male or female. Mm. This is this is my choice for the week. Who's a hot Ooh, pastor? Oh, you just picked a really hard question. You know who I'm really listening to at the moment is um, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. Okay. And she's a pastor in the Seattle area. Um, and Pastor Eugene Cho um, founded this church and then she was a pastor there. But she talks about real things and she says the truth exactly the way it is. And I love her. I can listen to her preaching and walk away going, yes, it was just honest, applicable, and just accurate. And she teaches with understanding. So she's not just giving you knowledge, but you can tell she actually understands. Like she is living the things that she preaches and she understands the struggle of real life. And I just love her. <laughs> Pastor Ashley Abercrombie, thank you so yeah, much for being here. Thank so you so much here. for sharing with us. I, I need a high five for recovery. Yes. I'm a big fan of you. That's what Love I'm my Ambo about. TV fam. What? <laughs> Family, since the start. Everybody at home, please, when you get a chance, check out Rise of the Truth Teller. When is this on shelves? October 1st. October 1st. It is available everywhere. I expect everyone to check this book out. <laughs> Um, I'm co-signing it already. Thank you, friend. So there, you got my seal of approval. And we're going to be back with more Ambo TV. This morning, you might think you know what you need, but Jesus says, I know what you really need. And it's, it's not just a physical healing. It's not just a mental healing. It's not just an emotional healing, but there is spiritual healing. There is a new identity, a true identity that God is wanting to give you today. But you have to ask yourself, are you willing to put in the work to get it? Because she fought through the crowd. Well, there you have it, folks. And as we like to do at the end of every show with our short clip is I like to ask our guest pastor to give the folks at home a Bible scripture that ties in 
to that last and final clip. Do you mm -hmm. have something for us? I do. Great. So actually in Ephesians 2.10, it talks about how you are God's workmanship. And another version, it says masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works that were prepared in advance before you got here that you should walk in them. And so God actually, before you were even born and formed you in your mother's womb, he knew that you were created as his masterpiece to do incredible things on the earth. So whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever difficulty, whatever challenge before you remember, that you were created for good works, that God has great plans for you. You are his workmanship, his masterpiece. That is fantastic. <laughs> Pastor Ashley, you're such an inspiration. Ah, so good Love to be you. Love you so guys. much. Thank you so much for being <laughs> here. Please come back again. I'd love to. All right, uh, to everyone at home, please go check out Pastor Ashley's book, The Rise of the Truth Teller. It's out October 1st, but you can pre-order it right now. How cool is that? To our partnering churches, Cape Coral Church with Pastor John Weasel, Valley Christian Church with Pastor Stephen Francis, and Crossroad Community Church with Pastor Daniel Fusco. Thank you guys for those inspiring messages. To see the complete sermons and other great sermons, head over to ambotv.com. We always have great content for you guys there. Sign up for the newsletter. Thank you for watching. Good night, and I will see you next week. I'm out.